Now we have the first talk of the day. Yeah, please welcome on stage Sebastian Kurfürst. Good morning, everybody. I'm extremely happy to be here on this stage again, to see all of you in front of me. Um, I'm actually having goosebumps right now, you know, uh, because the last two years, uh, giving, doing all the talks just online, um, we tried our best. Um, but by, by the way, who has watched the talks online? Can you? Oh, quite some people. That's really, really cool, because it's way better to speak here, actually, than to speak in front of uh, some camera. <laughs> so um, I'm really, really happy to be here. And it's really cool that you are all uh, interested. So I'm going to talk about the new content repository. Um, I'm Sebastian Kurfürst. I'm the co-founder of Sandstorm, one of the organizers of this event. and. I'm in the NEOS project since pretty much forever. Well, actually, um, I'm currently 33 years old. I think I started Type 3 back when I was 14 or 15 or something. And I actually counted how much time I have been spending with the event sourced content repository. And it turned out the first workshop was uh, six years ago, seven years ago. So that means actually I've spent seven of my life, uh, years of my life, uh, somehow talking and thinking about the event source content repository. Yeah, and I thought, whoa, <laughs> that is a long time. And what I'm going to try today is basically give uh, a status where we are right now, um, how we want to proceed, and I think we're getting close to a release. So, Actually, what are we talking about? So NEOS is um, built of different packages. So we have the flow framework underneath. We have the NEOS user interface and the NEOS uh, core packages on top. We have Fusion, the asset storage, and also the content repository in the meantime. And the content repository is one of the main, imp most important packages because that's actually where our data lives, where our content lives. So that's why it's so extremely important, this package. And you have worked with the content repository one way or the other, be it as a user, if you, you see the node tree or the content tree, or as an integrator, uh, if you use Flow Query, or also as a developer, if you use the node API, the node interface API. And as it turns out, you know, with all the things we do, <laughs> I have the feeling we need three times to get it really, really right. So three iterations, three redoings uh, completely. And actually, um, so, so we can explain what we need to change and why we wanted to change it. So actually, what we wanted to achieve with the rewrite of the content repository is having a solid foundation with a great scalability and, and performance for the data layer of NEOS. And it's a very high expectation. I'm really aware of that. Um, and we are aiming f so that this is the content storage foundation for at least the next 10 years. And when we thought, like, how should it behave, how should it look, um, there was one metaphor we always came up with again and again. And actually, it's like that it should be like Git, like Git for content. And I know, you know, this sets the bar extremely high. You know, Git is just so robust, it is so fast, it is so well, well thought of in terms of the concepts um, that it really brought this space extremely forward. And with the content repository, we aim for exactly that, for everything which is related to content. And um, I think we are not fully there yet, but we have the foundations ready, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. And to give you a perspective, actually, what problems we have with the current content repository, um, I'll just take a really easy example and walk through that, and then we'll explain how we are doing that in the, uh, with the new content repository so that you get an idea of what is actually different between the old, the current world, and the new world. So let's take an example of actually moving a node. So I'm taking the demo side. I'm just moving a single page here down. Um, that actually looks quite simple. And we have to wait a bit. You all know that. And Suddenly, we have 154 changes. What the hell? Why are there so many changes? Who actually can explain that? <laughs> Who says, why is that happening? 
Actually, I'm saying, like, why is that happening? In terms of the user, it doesn't make any sense at all, right? But what's happening technically is actually that there was a design decision we've been taking many, many years ago, um, uh, how we store the node data. And that was uh, using a single database table with a thing called a materialized path um, in there. And the materialized path is basically the path up to the full root of, of all the nodes uh, in the tree. So that means if you move one node with all the nodes below, you actually need to move all the nodes below as well. And that means we don't need to just update the single node. This is also what we see here in the updated ones. But we also have to move all the nodes below that. And actually, it's even more complex than that because uh, we have this mechanism called the shine-throughs. Um, so, you know, we have the live workspace and your user workspace, and it's like a layer in Photoshop, basically. So now when we move something in our user workspace, the, the live content still shines through. So, you know, we need some special masking to ensure that this doesn't happen. So that means we don't have any node just once, but actually we have it twice because we need to prevent the live nodes to shine through. Basically, that you know, you don't have to think about all that if you just understood half of it. It doesn't matter. I also understand just half of that. What I'm just talked about. So, um, and the code which does all that is really, really complicated and weird to understand, and so on and so on. It is just to illustrate that we have some uh, well design. We had some building block design issues actually in the current version. And there are also lots and lots of edge cases in moving nodes. Um, so for instance, if you remember, we moved one node and we had 152 changes. If we published that right away, actually things would go right pretty well. But just imagine another editor has changed a single property of any of these nodes, you know, beneath the features somewhere. It just changed the title or something like that. As soon as that happens, we would have um, um, a conflict and which would be hard to handle. And, and I think many bugs in the current content repository and many inconsistencies we face or our users face happens exactly due to that, that we have the, the, um, something like a move operation and conflicting with any other operation happening. And uh, this usually or sometimes leads to an inconsistent state. And actually, I didn't talk about the dimensions yet. So dimensions are another layer which make all that really complex. And we have a long, long list of features we would like to provide to our users. Um, and, but because the foundation is the way it is and the way I just explained, it's actually pretty hard to evolve with new features uh, in terms of versioning or undo or redo, for instance, just because the data structure underneath is just really, really well tied to the way it's done currently. And we are at this, at this brink of complexity, basically, where we, when we add another of these complex features, we all have the feeling that like, the complexity would explode very much. So that's why we uh, try to fix bugs and we try to make small modifications to the current content repository. But that's also why it was really clear to us that we need to do it in a different way. Another feature we would like to provide is uh, better third-party integration. So who uses Elasticsearch? Uh, in, yeah, many people. And who has seen this nice error message when Elasticsearch is off uh, offline, uh, when, you, when it crashes your backend, basically? Yeah, also quite some people. So I would like to have that better working and more resiliently working as well. And I would personally also like better publishing features. So like in Git, where you have something like a conflict resolution, where you have traceability um, or some kind of debugging, actually, what has happened? You know, I, I have spent countless hours of my personal life and the life of my team looking at database dumps of the uh, node data table and trying to figure out what the hell, how could this ever ended up in this weird state? And sometimes you have some ideas, and sometimes you're like, what the hell, we have to try again next time. I don't know. <laughs> so these, these, um, there are certain areas where these instabilities happen, um, usually related to the event log, um, to the search indexing, what we already discussed, to things like tracking the asset changes, and also, uh, Publishing actually is quite slow in the current uh, current version, and 
that is because um, we have done another design decision uh, very early on, which was embracing the doctrine object relational mapper, the doctrine ORM. And actually, that was also very difficult because that leads to huge database queries, which, is, which are very hard to optimize. And we, we have lots of transient state to update. So that means if things go wrong, it usually doesn't go wrong in the way we anticipated. And the whole NEOS team has done a lot, a lot, a lot of work to make that stable and more and more and more stable. So that means, you know, I don't want to sound that negative, actually. I think the current content repository is doing its job amazingly well. And I think also that is really uh, we deserve, or, or the team um, like Christian and Bastian and all the other people of the NEOS team, they deserve a huge applause for really fixing the small and small and small issues. So thank you, everybody. Because, you know, I'm standing here on stage and I'm presenting the new ideas and so on, but, you know, that only works because we have so many dedicated people also um, working and, and fixing the bugs in the current system, make it more and more stable. So, okay, let's talk about the new world. Let's talk about um, what we want to go, where we want to go. So, the new content repository is built around a fundamentally different concept than the current version. And this means that there needs to be a shift in thinking in all of our heads, and not just the heads of the core developers or the heads inventing that, but basically of all our community. We need to look at the problem of storing data in a different way, in a different angle, and we need to unlearn some old habits. It's not that much, but a few of them, um, and we, we need to learn new habits. And um, most of these habits revolve around two things. The one is about um, the object relational mapper. We basically need to unlearn the object relational mapper and the abstraction related to that. And the other one is related to what expectations we have to consistency. So consistency means or, or describes as an abstract property um, how basically well-behaved the system is if multiple users access it. So that means, uh, for instance, a system would not be consistent if I tweet something and then I reload my timeline and the tweet would be gone. That would be really weird. And then it somehow shows up after some time, you know? That would be not consistent. I, as a user, expect um, if I enter a tweet and I reload the page, then I directly see my tweet. That is my personal expectation. And we can also formalize that a bit uh, in, 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 in computer science terms, there's actually two sides of the story. The one is immediately consistent, um, the other one is not consistent. Uh, immediately consistent is also called strongly consistent. And then there's uh, a big space in between, and this space in between means eventually consistent. Uh, what is important, eventually, for everybody in German here, this doesn't mean eventuell, so it doesn't mean it might happen or not, but eventually means at some point in the future it's guaranteed to happen. And it's some point in the future means, means usually really, really soon. So we're talking in milliseconds, in, at worst case, one or two seconds or something like that. So that means we, we let's take the Twitter example. Um, that means um, for an immediately consistent system, if I tweet something, we would expect everybody in the world to see my tweet exactly in the same time when I have tweeted it, directly afterwards, for everybody in the world. That would be immediately consistent. But usually that doesn't really matter, you know? It, it, it doesn't matter if you or you or you see the tweet a few seconds later, because it will still feel consistent to you personally. What is important is that it will show up eventually after a short amount of time in your timeline if you follow it, the NEOS project, for instance. So, and by embracing eventual consistency, we have huge and huge and huge possibilities to optimize because we can optimize for the user's expectations, but we can move operations which take long time um, um, basically to the background, and that is a big shift in thinking. And <laughs> this shift in thinking is actually happening because we are embracing a concept called event sourcing and CQRS. Um, and the talk was actually called Event Source Content Repository, and you have, might have heard about that also. 
And uh, when preparing that, I've actually thought about it more on a conceptual level. So actually, if that we use event sourcing is not important for the new content repository. What is important is that we use eventual consistency. So, and event sourcing is basically the technical mechanism how we enable that. I think it still makes sense uh, for you to understand what is basically happening because it means you can use that also in your projects, be it with the, with the new content repository or without. So what is event sourcing? Uh, it's best compared to the classical CRUD style database architecture. So where we have a database at the bottom, we have our model layer on top, and then we have modify operations and read operations, right? And the event source architecture actually uh, looks pretty similar, but we don't store, or our core of information storage is not a database anymore, but it's a thing called an event store. And what is an event store? An event store is a um, timeline, basically, where we can only append new events. So that means we can never change anything in the history, what has happened, but we can only add things to the end. So it's technically that's called an append-only store. And um, that has, the, the has many benefits, as we will see, because we basically don't forget anything anymore in, in, in layman's terms. So that means instead of modifying the system state, we are actually able to uh, append events um, to do things. And instead of reading the events, so, so then in the event store, you basically have this list like what has happened when. That is nice for like, tracing what has happened. But of course, it would be really impractical if we would always need to see all the millions of events to just figure out, is this node visible or not? Or does this node even exist? Or does this node have a child node or anything like that? So that means we need something on the read side to happen as well. And this is actually a concept called a projection. Um, and the projections are pretty much like the database tables you're used to right now, and that's also how they can look like usually. So actually what is happening is a shift in thinking um, that we place something in front of our model, which we call the event store and the event log, and this becomes our central nervous system of, this, of, of the whole um, 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 ecosystem, basically. So let's talk quickly about how the projections work. So just remember, in the event store, we have this list of events happening one by one. So the projection is basically a model like database tables, stuff like that. We, we in the event source CR use uh, just simple database tables. And uh, we update, uh, as new events come in, we update the state in the database tables, just as you would used to, and then we can just query these database tables as we are used to, just as you query your model right now. You might wonder, actually, why is that a big difference? Well, there are two key things here. The one is projections can be rebuilt. So that means just imagine there's any weird state which has happened in the projections. What you can do is you can empty your database tables, and I know that looks really scary now, you know, throw out all your data, it doesn't matter. But then you start applying the event one, you change your state, you apply event two, three, four, and so on, until you have, you are, you are, you've catched up, um, caught up to the current state. And by doing that, um, you will not just reach the current state when you have applied all the events, but you will have, in the meantime, also reached all the in intermediate states, and that is so amazingly great for debugging. You know, you can exactly trace where things went wrong, actually. And that actually means that the days where you look at some database dumps and are like, what the hell, what has happened here? This is actually gone. So that's the one benefit. And to understand the second benefit, we need to follow uh, the interactions of one, uh, one um, 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 path, basically, through the system. So that means one user interaction, one modification to the system. So let's follow along a user interaction, like creating a node. The first thing we have is a thing called a command. A command is something like, please create this node for me. It records the user's intention. Um, then the command is converted to e an event that basically means uh, an, um, a node has uh, been created, and this is stored to the event store. So the difference is the command is basically saying, please try this for me, and then the system can say, yeah, this worked, or no, this didn't work. 
but as soon as the event has been persisted to the event store, it has happened. So that means the system cannot say anymore, well, this didn't work anymore, but it has to, you know, it has to work with it. It is persisted at this point in time. Don't worry, that's just a technical detail, basically. So then we have the event store, and now we update our projections. Um, the most important projection is so-called the content graph, um, and that is, I would say, the second main innovation in this new uh, content repository, the first one being the whole event source architecture, and the second one being actually the way we store the data in the database in this content graph. And just for, for, for completeness, um, the one side is called the right side, because it has, it's dealing with the writing, and the other side is dealing with the reading, uh, the projection side. And the border between the blue and the white world on both sides, actually that is the consistency border. So that means that is eventually consistent. To put it in words, what does that mean? It means that when an event is persisted in the event store, it takes a small amount of time until the projections reflect this state change. So that takes a bit, basically, to catch up. And there are some ways to work around that, as we'll see. So by doing that, so, so this is pretty much what you have, basically, if you would use a database, a classical database architecture, and put an event store in front of it. But what you get now is that you can add new projections. So that mean, means you can denormalize your model for different scenarios and different use cases. You, know, you no longer need this one-size-fits-all model, um, what is used with the classical database uh, world, you know, where you have this one big um, uh, database schema which has to be useful for any use case. But you can do specific models which can solve some specific problems very efficiently. So that means we have one model, for instance, which, which deals with the workspace changes, which is just responsible for displaying this counter up there in the uh, top right corner of the NEOS user interface. And then Bastian has worked with, uh, has created another, another um, uh, one, which is the routing and linking um, projection, um, which tremendously speeds up building links and resolving the links. So that means we can build a link just with a single database query, and right now we sometimes take a lot of them, and I think that is a really great improvement where we see lots and lots of performance benefits as well. So by doing that, we're able to optimize specific parts very, very heavily towards certain use cases. Um, I think what is still important that one, um, one model is like the main one, and that is the content graph. So like, if you don't know where to look, you'll probably start there. But you are still able to add additional models, additional projections on the read side as well. So when we do that, we get some, uh, we get some benefits. And, and actually, the new content repository enables quite some benefits for us, uh, which I'm going to explain uh, right now. So after this detour of what is actually event sourcing, which powers all this logic and all the system, we'll get back to the outer layer again of, of the, uh, of the uh, NEOS uh, new content repository. And let's explain what this enables, what this foundation does to us. So we can, again, build features which our users want. For instance, undo is a feature which we really want to build and which this is the foundation for us to build. Um, so that means in the first version of the new CR, there won't be any undo, at least not from the core team, probably. Um, but we have the foundation to build that in a really good way later on. Um, or anybody in the community is, of course, also free to build that. And we, we would be really happy to have out with that as well and to support you there. So if you need that with the new CR, then please get in touch with us, and we can guide you towards a good path. We can also, or we will also have more and more stability, because um, Moving one node only uh, creates one single change, one single event. And that also means that that's only one uh, point where a conflict can happen. So that means if we move a parent node and somebody changes a node underneath, that's not a problem at all. You know, it will directly, um, there will be no merge conflicts like we have right now. We will have way, way, way better debugging. It is so extremely helpful to, um, to answer what has the user actually really done? How did we end up in this weird state? 
you know, the question where we started up in the beginning, we can actually trace one by one by one and we can figure out exactly where did the weird thing happen. And of course, this might be due to a bug in the content repository, for instance, but we will be exactly able to trace where this happened and then replay that again and again and again, exactly this point where the error happened. So it's basically like time traveling. You know, you can always jump back to a certain state where you know, okay, this was all good, and then you can travel to the point where the actual error happened. And that is extremely valuable. Then we have way better performance and scalability with the new content repository. Um, because we don't use the doctrine ORM anymore, the object relational mapper, but we write plain SQL and uh, we can hand tune that very much and the queries get a lot easier and a lot well, better, well, uh, better optimized so the database can handle them a lot easier. And this content repository should not be useful for using within NEOS, but actually it should be usable for many, 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 many more scenarios. So, for instance, in a standalone case, if you just need content uh, without the NEOS ecosystem outside, or um, if you want to use that in a Symfony application, we have laid the foundations for that. If you want to use multiple sites, I'm come to that, or if you want to store assets in the content repository, you also want to enable that by that. And the system is really, really extensible, so you will be able to add new features like synchronization or undo or redo on top of the foundation. So that means we can decouple the work also and we can experiment again more and more with it. But still, we, ha we are keeping concepts which work really well. So that means uh, in the old content repository, in the current one, we have the workspaces, dimensions with fallbacks, migrations, node repair, and node types. And actually, this is pretty much staying the same. Sometimes the namings are adjusted a bit, so, so node repair is called consistency checks and integrity violations. And the workspace concept is uh, extended with a concept called content streams. But that's just really details. You know, basically these concepts all stay like they are, and especially the node types concept stays like it is. So that means the, the, the external uh, API is exactly the same. But we also change APIs which were difficult, and the, the main three APIs which were really difficult in the current content repository was the node data repository, the node data object, and the node interface. You know, the node interface is like I don't know. 3,000 methods long. Uh, I don't know, it's really, really huge. It has grown tremendously over time. It's just a pile of everything which you can do there. And n not to mention the layers below, that's even, even more difficult to, to poke through that. So in the new content repository, we have the event store, we have the events, we have the commands and the projections. They are extensible. And we can take this whole package, shrink it down, and instantiate multiple instances of that. So that is huge. Because that means you can take one of these packages and run them just in a Symfony application. But also inside NEOS, you will be able um, to have one site, for instance, in one of these content repositories without any dimensions. And in the second content repository, uh, you could have the site B and C, so two other sites with German and English dimension. And in the third content repository instance, we could just have Engl uh, assets stored with an even different dimension fallback configuration. So that we hope that this actually solves many ways or many parts of the problem uh, where you want to run a multi-site installation, but actually you have different dimension fallbacks, for instance, what we don't support right now. And we're also um, experimenting, uh, as already said, uh, to use that without NEOS, and we've done prototypes for that, and also without Flow. So we have done a prototype with just Symfony, and uh, the content repository is not yet ready for that. So it's just prepared for that, but we need some more time to finish that. But actually, the event sourcing core package, you know, the underlying foundation uh, which we've created, that is actually already usable in Symfony. And uh, Timo Nussbaum will, in two hours, I think, at 12 o'clock, he will show um, uh, his, uh, how this works in a Symfony uh, project um, remote on the other stage. So that is a really cool thing. So um, what are the three main innovations we are doing with the event source content repository? So first, we are capturing users' intentions through commands and events with the concept called event sourcing. Then we have the content graph, 
And third, we have a clean and extensible PHP API, which is really, really good. So now let's talk about when. So how and when are we getting this? And of course, that is a question we are getting again and again. And I totally understand. I really, really want to use that. And um, well, to put it short, we are really confident that NEOS 9.0 will contain the new content repository. And there's just a little star on that because it's a preliminary decision. So as you know, we have a Neo Sprint directly after the conference um, here in Dresden. And there we will really decide that. And, but, but, but Bastian and Robert and Bernhard and some others, we have really thought it through quite a lot already. So we'll figure out the details uh, um, um, and then see if we forgot anything with the whole team. But the idea, and we are really confident right now that this will actually work out, that NEOS 9.0 will contain the new CR. And I'm going to explain now what this actually means. So that means what packages are changed, how we are going to do that, and what you need to modify um, in your packages. Because it's a community effort, and we need to move all of our stuff forward to the new world. So right now, we have two collections. Uh, if you try out the content repository, you have the NEOS development collection, which you all know. And then we have the NEOS content repository development collection, which is a layer on top. You know we like layers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a layer on top, basically, um, uh, which was good for experimenting and was good for, for testing it all out together. But for the actual going live state, this won't work in practice. We've, we've thought it in detail, and uh, the way it will work out really the best way is the most easy and simple and clear strategy, which is we will merge all the changes from the separate uh, collection into the NEOS development collection. And I'm going to explain now how this timeline actually will work and how we are going to do that. So right now, um, it's, oh, it's the last day of April. Ooh. <laughs> so uh, NEOS 8.0 was released. So uh, thanks again to everybody involved releasing 8.0. And that is actually the NEOS development collection. And then we have uh, the, the master branch right now. And what we would normally do is actually we would develop the master branch, and then at some point we would release 8.1 from that, and then 8.2, and so on and so on. This is going to change now. So what we are going to do is we will directly fork the 9.0 branch of the 8.0 branch. And what we'll also do is, just to avoid confusion, we'll basically rename the master branch to, to 8.1 so that it's really consistent. So basically, this means this branch will become 8.1 at some point. This branch will become 9.0 at some point. Um, don't worry, we, we of course don't delete the master branch, it just won't get updated anymore, so we won't break your composer um, installations. So then what we'll do is actually we'll take the NEOS content repository development collection changes and merge them into the master branch. And as soon as that is done, we'll re release the 9.0 alpha 1 version. And what this enables us is that we can do regular upmerges like we do in the, in, the, uh, in the current version of NEOS. So if, if we have a bug fix for an older version, we will upmerge them one by one un until it ends up in the newest version. And that is what we can do then. So all the changes which, go, which are developed for 8.1, we will regularly upmerge them to 9.0 so that, it, that we don't diverge that much anymore. So that's the one, that's the technical idea. And the second part is actually then is uh, when, when August 22 arrives and 8.1 is released, um, actually, um, we will, um, we will um, release, probably release a new alpha as well for the 9.0 branch. And we will, um, we will do lots of communication. So that's the second very important part. So in all the official releases coming now, you, will, uh, you can expect some com communication, like what is the status, where are we on our path? 
And it might sound something like, you can start using the new CR alpha for projects with not that many, many package dependencies, you know, because the packages need to change, or some packages need to change, which use the Node API. So that is some communication you will see in the release announcement in the 8.1 version, probably. Then in December, we'll release 8.2 and the corresponding alpha again. And actually, there we might have communication like, please adjust your packages for NEOS 9.0. Here are some guides to do that, these kind of things. And then um, in uh, April 23, 8.3 LTS is released. And um, afterwards, if all goes well, actually, August 23, August next year, we will release NEOS 9.0 if all goes to plan. Yes. <laughs> so um, it, it might be that we need an another 8.4, for instance, if, if something is not ready, but that's actually what we plan for, and I think it's very realistic to also keep that. Um, but this means actually you actually have time starting with 8.1 until 9.0 to gradually adjust your packages and gradually, you know, start with the easy projects, start with new projects with a new CR. And we as a community can actually gain experience in production um, more and more and more. And, and, and then with, uh, I don't know, with 9.0, we can start moving the, um, the bigger projects, which have lots of package dependencies because the packages already exist for the new version. And um, of course, um, big changes uh, will be coordinated with the 9.0 branch. So that means if anybody um, of the core team, but we also hope that everybody in the community who would like to contribute something big to the 8.0 branch, 8.1, 8.2, 8.3 branch, please let us know um, so that we can um, coordinate that together. So one thing we had in mind, for instance, is for the workspace module, we would like to have a better diff view at some point, and um, that is something we would like to have. If somebody of you wants to work on that, for instance, because he needs it for a project, please talk to us so that we can make sure that there's a generic API which can be used from 9.0 from the event source part and from the, from the uh, classical part as well. And we strive for public um, API compatibility during, uh, during the alpha versions, um, but of course we cannot fully promise it yet, but as, at least that's what we're really aiming for one by one. Right, so where are we right now? Actually, there are, I would say there are no unknown unknowns anymore. So um, the, this, this, the core of the content repository, of the new content repository is really, really stable. If you saw the changes happening in the last few years, up to like a year from now, we still had big, uh, like bigger organizational changes in the packages. I think in the, in the last year, we didn't ever, ever have to change a single uh, event in the, in the backend, for instance. Um, what has uh, been our efforts in the last uh, months was actually getting the upper layers right, getting the fusion integration right, getting right how you access the content repository within NEOS, and this is what we are still going to do. Um, we are pushing it as fast as we personally can. Um, and of course, um, it also matters like how much momentum can we get in the community. You know, we cannot release 9.0 if uh, no package basically has been updated to work with that. You know, that won't work out. It doesn't make any sense. You know, it doesn't make sense to say, oh, that's a nice shiny version, but of course you can't use it because nobody cares, you know. <laughs> so actually we need a community effort. We need all of you um, um, as the core team. Uh, we want to reach out to you and want to um, uh, together want to reach that goal. So what can you expect from the CR in NEOS 9.0? You know, I've explained a lot about now like, the big vision, the big ideas we want to reach in the future with, with all these things. So in, in, in NEOS 9.0, there will very likely be no undo or redo feature, at least not, not from the core team, if, uh, if nobody in the community steps up. But what is inside? It's, it's a stable API. It is the rendering and fusion layer, which runs unmodified in like 95% of the cases. That's actually a state we already have. It is the feature to run multiple content repositories. Uh, that is something um, which we are preparing right now um, and which will 
uh, which will happen uh, just uh, together with the merge uh, into the NEOS uh, uh, collection branches. And the user interface will probably be really similar to what we have right now. It will just run with a new foundation underneath. And I'm personally looking so much forward to have the foundations done so that we can start building the cool features on top, you know, like the nice user interfaces and so on. So actually, um, that is what we all want to get to. But of course, first we need to get the foundations ready. Right. And then there's one thing uh, we need to talk about. Um, who is using MySQL or MariaDB? Who is using Postgres? A few? Ah, oh, it's getting more and more people. That is nice. So, um, I personally, I, I, I have been the same. You know, like 90% of our projects run on MySQL, for instance. Um, but I've been studying the Postgres manual and books more and more enthusiastically. Uh, and I was like, oh, there are so many cool features in, like multi-value fields, like JSON with index, like um, full text search in the database, and so on and so on. And um, there's one, so, so Bernhard is actually currently working on the Postgres support for the event source content repository. So right now we only support My, uh, MariaDB MySQL, but uh, Bernhard is working on the Postgres version as well, on the Postgres uh, content, content graph. And one feature would really help us. And um, to explain that, um, I, I would like to explain how the, um, how the graph relation actually works, because that demonstrates it really well. So right now, what we have is we have two nodes, the parent and the child node, and we have a single connection from the parent to the child, as you would expect. And if you have uh, uh, two nodes in the sublayer, we have two connections from the top to the bottom. So that means we have two database entries you know, and if you have three ch children, we have three database entries, and so on and so on. With um, the uh, multi-value fields in Postgres, what we can actually do is we can have like a cable which has just one end on the top and has three ends at the bottom, you know, some, some multi-core cable basically, um, which means that we only need a single database row to store that. And if you imagine that by, by um, if, if you, in, on average, a node has, let's say, five child nodes, um, we get an, a, a reduction of data in, terms of, uh, in the terms of a factor of five. If, if you have a big site which has, on average, 10 child nodes, then we get a reduction of data in the database by a factor of 10. And I'm not talking percent, I'm talking factors here. So the system will get 10, um, we will have to deal with five times less data or 10 times less data. And this speed up we have tested is so extremely um, valuable that actually um, we, are, we will probably recommend Postgres for big installations with, Marie, um, uh, with the event source content repository. Oh, everybody is stunned. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's shocked now, silence, oh God, what is happening? <laughs> no, so again, uh, we know that it takes some time. Uh, we also have you covered for MySQL and MariaDB, so smaller installations will, of course, still work, and that's not a problem at all. Um, but for big installations, I think actually Postgres is really, really beneficial. And I think we as a community, we can extremely profit from changing our mindset to Postgres as well in the upcoming months and, and years, because we can then profit from so many features which are in there. We don't need Elasticsearch for simple cases. Uh, we can index JSON directly, for instance. Yeah, <laughs> that all works, and it doesn't with MySQL. Right. So how do we need to adjust our packages? Um, let's go through an example. Um, don't worry um, in, in the slides. So um, if you know the Node API, it will get used to it. Um, if you want to create a node right now, you just use node create node right now in the old world. And then you can set a property, right? Um, actually, that's not. Um, um, when are the things persistent? I don't know. <laughs> and the difficult question is now, how get we, do we get the parent node in the current world? Who actually could write down directly how to get the parent node here? I can't. Ah, Robert. Okay, Carsten, you don't count. So actually, it's like this. It's easy, right? Context factory create, blah, 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 blah. I always have to look this up, copy paste this from some other project. It's just the hell. In the new world, it's a bit different. 
um, actually we create a command. It says, please create a new node. And what we have to add in is something like a workspace. We have to generate a new identifier. We have a node type. Um, we have the information which language version to create. Uh, we need some user identifier, the idea, and the initial values. So, and what we then need to do is we need to pass this command to a thing called the command handler. Don't worry about that in detail, but just think about, okay, creating a command and submitting it to the system. And this will mean that sometimes this node will be created. Or sometimes it's useful to know, okay, this has already happened. So um, what we have is some nice feature called block until projections are up to date. So the line really at the bottom of the screen right now. This is actually what helps us to ensure that things are really, really persistent and in the state and so on and so on. So um, creating node looks a bit different from the code size. It's pretty similar, but I think from the concept, it's way easier. If we read nodes in the old version, um, well, you still need to do the same context stuff. So you somehow need to get the context, and, but then you can traverse the nodes, you can traverse properties, but you can only do that one by one. So you only can, uh, can do this um, um, like individually or step by step. And in your world, um, it's a bit different. Um, everything you, see you get is plain value objects. They are read only, they are immutable. You can pass them on wherever you want. It's really fast because there's no object relational mapper involved. Um, but there's one difference, and this is you don't go to the node itself to ask for its children, but you go to the node accessor. And this means we need to create our node accessor, and we need to say, okay, I want to access a node in a certain workspace without dimensions and in the front end or in the back end, for instance. So that means it can restrict it to hidden or non-hidden pages, um, uh, nodes as usual. If we have the node accessor, we can do something like find a node by identifier, um, and then we can do something like, uh, yeah, give me the properties of the node. And um, yeah, it looks a bit complicated now, probably because we have all these value objects which bloat this up a bit, but actually you won't notice that usually because it's very rare that you will create such a value object from scratch, but usually you have them already on the parent node. But this means actually you cannot do anything wrong anymore with the API because every property is type safe. You know, there's not just string, 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 and you need to pass on the second to last string you pass in the node name or something like that, like it's right now, but it's all type safe uh, parameters, um, which is way easier to use. <laughs> oh. Thanks. <laughs> so, and when you have the node accessor, you can again find the child nodes of a certain node, for instance. Yeah. What about Fusion and Flow Query? Well, actually, it stays the same, pretty much, except just uh, uh, two things. The context operation is, dis is deprecated because basically we don't have a, a, a context anymore, but we still, for very common operations, we have some legacy layer which bridges it to the, the old and the new world together. So that means um, we can do something like context uh, workspace name and context invisible content shown. This will still work. And the second change is, um, asking a node for a node path. It will actually work, but it's really, really slow because we have to go all the way up, so that is a really slow operation. So best is actually to not uh, rely on the path information, so don't do that if possible. And that, that's like the amount of adjustments you, will, you might need to do in your fusion. So you will grab for stuff like dot .context, for dot .node path, and then start adjusting that according to the, the rules, basically. There are also some other ideas. Um, you need to, um, so, so, so the standard flow query operations, they will work right out of the box. If you have custom flow query operations in PHP, you need to re-implement them um, with the APIs I've shown beforehand. And we also have some crazy ideas, or actually Bernhard has some crazy ideas in the room, so if you uh, want to learn a lot about graphs and hyper and I don't know what, what other really cool, and cipher and, and really cool stuff, um, 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 yeah, so just ask Bernhard about that. Um, he's, he's really hyped about that, and I can... I only understand half of it, actually, what, he's, what he explains, but I think it's really cool, and with the content graph, he's already pushed the limits really a lot. Right, so what is important is, please let us coordinate big, bigger changes together. So let's meet in the Slack channel um, if you want to build a new workspace module 
or if you want to build a new part of the Neos UI, for instance, and then please let's just talk and make sure that it fits together so we don't need to do the thing twice. If you want to learn anything about the new content repository, um, there's, uh, I think, a few resources which I can point to. The, the most recent one is actually that um, Helmut Hummel and myself, hi Helmut, um, um, have, been recording, um, have been recording a web series, and we'll continue to do that after the conference as well, uh, where we deep dive into certain parts of the NEOS user interface, uh, of the NEOS uh, content repository, and go through that step by step. Every episode is like an hour long, more or less, and it touches an individual topic of the content repository. The first one gives an overview. The second one um, um, uh, targets the graph projection. The third one targets implementation details. Um, this is all in German, um, because that was uh, more easy for us to talk there. Uh, we also have resources in English, as I'll show in a bit. So uh, one thing is, on the docs side, there's quite some documentation already available, but it's just moved to a weird place because it's inside contributing to NAOs. Um, um, and uh, so it's in contributing, and then there's event source content repository. We'll probably move that somewhere else, but that's where you find it right now because it's not yet part of you know, the public API. Then again, I've already said the Slack channel, this is the easiest way to reach all of us. Yeah, so let's talk about what we want to achieve from that. So I personally would like to have something like that, you know, some time slider, something like showing what has actually changed. That would be so nice, so amazing. Actually, this was created by Jens Hoffmann many, many, many years ago. You still see the Typo 3 logo on the top right. So that was one of the core ideas driving us for so many years now. And I think with the Events of CR, we actually have the basis to make that a reality. I personally would like to have editing notifications. So something like, oh, you know, uh, something has changed. Do, did, you need to translate something. You need to do something here. These kind of things. This is all information I personally would love for our editors to have. I'd love to have something like synchronization between instances so that we can send content to another instance in a federated way and not build a big ecosystem where everything is locked together, but actually where we can pass information on and share information between instances. But in the end, it's all up to your ideas. We want to enable you to build great software and a great basis where we couldn't even think about what, what, um, what, you, um, uh, what you come up with. So that is really what excites me most, actually. So that was quite a ride. So there's one, one topic uh, left to say. Actually, um, I've started the slide with um, with, uh, you remember, I've spent seven of my, uh, of, uh, of my 33 years talking and thinking about events or CR. Of course, I've slept and I've <laughs> spent some time with my family and with my company and so on, but still, that has been in my mind forever. This talks, these talks would not be complete without saying thanks. The biggest applause and thank you goes to Bastian and Bernhard, so thank you so much for everything you've done. So they are like the partners in crime, which, I, which we, we are calling each other at random times and saying like, oh, we had some crazy ideas and then we talked forever and it's such a pleasure to work with you and to discuss things. Um, also a big thanks to uh, Christian, Robert, Carsten and some others who have pushed the ideas at various points forward, who participated in workshops, who shaped the whole core idea. So thank you to all of you. <laughs> and I have two more thanks to say. The one is, Thank you, thank you, thank you to the whole NEOS team who stand behind these crazy ideas for such a long time, who improve NEOS again and again, bigger and smaller scale, who do all the tireless work of all the upmergers, of all the bug fixes, of all the reviews, and improve the NEOS on a daily basis. So thank you to all of you. <laughs> and it, 
I was I was at a at a point I was a bit scared like you know um, I was frightened in the beginning like okay do we do the team separate somehow um, but it didn't happen at all and I'm really really glad for that you know that we that everybody of the team no matter if he or she has done something in the event so CR ha has pushed that forward and and uh, followed this thinking so thank you so much and the last people I want to thank is the community is all of you. Thank you so much for being so curious and open-minded with so much positive energy um, who bared with us when we talked about it for so many years. So thank you so much. And now it's just saying me, let's rock this together and uh, let's get NEOS 9.0 out of the door with the rich ecosystem of all the packages supporting it with all of you together. Thank you so much for your attention. Wow, and uh, thank you, Sebastian, for a great talk. It's a pleasure. <laughs> wow, yeah. great. I think it's, it was a very good wrap-up of all the topics. I remember being at your company last year, I think, yeah. and you uh, told me everything in person, and it's, I think for all the new ones who didn't knew the topic, it's, it was great. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, you actually different topic. You put so much effort also, not only into the uh, event source content repository, but also here in this conference and the preparations and everything. How was your first day? Um, exciting. It was really cool to have everybody seeing here. Uh, like I was, we were talking like two, two days ago when the venue was still empty, you know, we were all like, oh, it's really going to happen. And I was all the days I was really frightened, like, okay, hopefully nobody in the, in the organizing team will get a positive test and these kind of things and like really <laughs> fingers crossed and these kind of things but actually it went really smoothly and um, yeah it was it's just a great pleasure to have everybody here again on stage and and talking in the break so it just feels so good wow great so we have some questions yes we have some questions um, actually about contribution um, there was a question uh, how could I contribute to the event sourced content repository? Yeah. So, um, uh, contributing can be done in various ways. So, best is actually first reaching out to you, uh, to us in the, in the Slack channel. And then we will, um, we'll just quickly have a chat together or talk, maybe call together, and then see, you know, what, 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 are, what are you doing? Are you like a PHP developer or, a, or a, a Fusion developer? Or what are your skills, basically? And then we'll find something which fits for you. So. Um, for instance, Helmut is contributing with me recording this thing, so he has not any pre, pre prior knowledge actually, but that makes it so valuable, you know, because it's, it's way easier to explain something with somebody who can ask really good questions together, for instance. So that is one part to contribute. Another one is just, um, um, is for instance, we, I would love if we would have these recordings also in English on the website in some sense or the other, you know. Um, um, or, and then, it, of course, also code-wise, um, I think um, now when, uh, in a, when we have merged into the 9.0 branch um, in a few weeks from now, um, then you can test it on your small projects, your big projects, give feedback. Um, we need to iron out the small glitches. By the way, the system has a huge test coverage. We have several thousand tests. The tests run for half an hour or something, so it's really, really a big basis. Wow. Um, so that, but that also means, you know, there's not much you can actually break, so so um, you don't have to fry it of trying out things. Yeah, great. Uh, question: uh, Will it also help, like sponsoring or financially? Yeah, it, actually, it would help really a lot. Um, in the last years, so so we have. Um, it was always the problem, like saying, okay, when is it actually ready? And we couldn't explain the answer, of course. And uh, we couldn't say, okay, this is how what we need. And it's still hard to put a price tag on it. Definitely, but um, what we've seen is that we've taken about 10,000 euro of the NEOS core team budget of, I think, 30 in total, so it's not that much, uh, but we've spent a sizable amount of that uh, for, for Bastian and me and, uh, and parts uh, and, and Bernhard. And uh, that helps because that shifts our priorities a bit. You know, it's, it's just way easier just to, to stay on the ball because the event source content repository is not a topic I can do like when I have half an hour left or something. But it's really something I need four hours at least to get into, to really be in, in a productive mood, so to speak. And then it is just a lot of fun. So yeah, funding definitely helps. 
the best way would actually to be if you if you signed up for sponsoring for the NEOS uh, community, um, so uh, on the booth outside or um, on the website, because then we as the NEOS team, we can allocate the funds then. That would be the easiest way, actually. Yeah, or you just come to any of us and talk yeah, to us. Yeah, sure, absolutely. About that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there are quite some questions coming in right wow. now. <laughs> Um, let's see. Um, how will a node in the new content repository be identified exactly unique? Uh, yeah. So, so it basically, it's again you have the workspace and the dimension. Uh, so that's like the basis. That's what you always need. And then you have the node identifier, and that's that's it. So it's pretty much the same. It's just that the uh, this this thing is actually what we call a node address. That is like a public identifier of a node, and these these three things together, and this identifies a node completely. Yeah. Um, let's pick the next one. By, oh, well, we think we are out of a schedule again, so you are used we to it, still, I think. We still have a slight <laughs> delay from yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but we have experts from uh, Deutsche Bahn helping us. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> will, it be, will it also be possible to have separate YAML node type configurations across different repositories in a multi-site installation? Yeah. That's a good question. So we don't. Uh, so we don't know yet. Basically, so right now we are doing the foundations just to get like the code base ready. But then on an, one of the next steps, you know, it would be like how you configure that. So that's not yet figured out. So that would be the idea to make this possible at some point. But we are not yet sure about the details yet. Yeah, yeah. and I guess I choose one small question. Please feel free to ask Sebastian af afterwards. Um, you can. No, I don't say it again. <laughs> what I've what I've been <laughs> saying many years ago. <laughs> Will there be a migration for the content from all to new in the content repository? Yeah, there is already a migration, So because we need a way to test that. So there is a command controller which reads the old node data and creates the events for the new one. So that's actually what we run for just testing it out. And what we can say, it, is, it, it seems to work pretty well. So of course, it works in the demo side, which is really small. But it also works with the doc side, which has a few thousand nodes already. And so the, the doc side is actually what we are testing it right now. So yeah, that is definitely there. And it's it's working pretty well. It still it might have some rough edges here and there, but uh, yeah, that's definitely there. Yeah. So thank you again. Um, well, we still have a present for you, of us. course. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, I think you didn't get yours yesterday, no, so you have that's it today. True. <laughs> we still have some missing. We <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, thank Sebastian. You. Really cool. Thanks a lot.